Chapter 14. Bruno tells a perfectly reasonable lie. Now, there's no such thing. So the title of the text is a, a bit of a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Ha I suppose having said that, though, there are times when it's important that we lie to protect certain things, but I don't know if we can ever describe them as being perfectly reasonable. So it's an interesting title, even from um, the opening of the text here. As usual, we start the text with, you know, a progression of time. So we've got, we're sustaining that typical structure. Um, and he's talking about just continuing on with his lessons with her lids and everything sort of just continues on as we would expect. Every day Bruno asks Shmuel whether he would be allowed to crawl underneath the wire so that they could play together on the other side of the fence. But every day Shmuel says no, it was not a good idea. So they're still continuing their friendship in that sort of regard. Um, and we know that the day that he does crawl under the fence to do this is the day that both of them die. So it, and it's kind of setting up that, that, that pathway for what's going to happen within the text. And they talk about their clothing and that sort of stuff. Um, and I love this line, I don't even like stripes, says Bruno, although this wasn't actually true in the uh, fact that he did like stripes and he felt increasingly fed up that he had to wear trousers and shirts and ties and shoes that were too tight for him when Shmuel and his friends got to wear striped pyjamas all day long. What a ridiculous thing to envy. You know, these kids are there because they're imprisoned and the only thing that, any way Bruno can respond is that he, he's jealous of the fact that they wear more comfortable clothing than him. Okay. Ignore the conditions, ignore the fact that he's been taken away from his family, ignore all of the other stuff that's going on. He just focuses on the clothing, which of course is very sort of childish sort of thing. As we continue through, um, this sort of the weather plays an important part in this text at this stage here because Obviously, if it's raining, Bruno can't really venture outside and go see Schmuel because they're not going to sit around in the rain. Even though it probably wouldn't bother Schmuel as much as it would Bruno. So he goes and has a chat with Gretel. He tries to entertain himself by talking to his sister. And they both sort of share this certain level of boredom at this stage, I suppose. And the quote that I've highlighted here um, sort of shows how sometimes their relationship is quite strong. Okay. But still, there are moments when a brother and sister can lay down the instruments of torture for a moment and speak as civilised human beings. And Bruno decided to make this one of those moments. So he's choosing to have a good relationship. He's not choosing to be an absolute pain in the neck with, with his sister. The, the typical annoying little brother. Okay. And they converse back and forward about the rain and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's at this point where Bruno almost slips up. He almost gives away that he, he sort of goes and sees Schmuel. And in the, in the um, ensuing dialogue, he's got to find a way out of this. Because um, he doesn't want to tell Gretel. He wants to keep this a secret. And he's, he's vowed to do that in one of the previous chapters, you may remember. And so he has to find a way around this. And he says, basically, said, makes out that he's got this imaginary friend, okay, which wouldn't be uncommon for a, student, uh, for a child that's younger than that, but um, Gretel finds this hilarious, as if you, you're, you're such a baby. I can't believe um, that this is the sort of thing that you're going and doing to fill your times. You must be going mad, is what she sort of thinks. Anyway, so he, he's, he's managed to get himself out of that. He's managed to find a way of... Um, getting around that and just deals with the taunting that he gets from his sister and Bruno considers the dilemma that he was in on one hand his sister and he had a crucial thing in common they were they weren't grown-ups and although he had never bothered to ask her there was every chance that she was just as lonely as he was at Outwith after all back in Berlin she had Hilda and Isabel and Louise to play with and they must have been annoying girls but at least they were her friends here she had no one at all except her collection of lifeless dolls. Who knew how mad Gretel was after all? Perhaps she thought the dolls were talking to her. So he sees a little bit of himself in his sister and he's actually able to sympathise and to empathise with Gretel and how she might be feeling. All right. 
Um, and this is where he reveals that he has the imaginary friend. This is how he gets out of it. Okay. So he doesn't have to reveal that he actually has a true friend. And he discovers after he does that, that when he then talks about um, this imaginary friend, he's actually talking about, um, I suppose, he's talking about, uh, this would be interesting. He's talking about Shmuel, but at the same time, pretending like it's an imaginary friend. Do you have a big plug or a little plug? Mm -hmm. Most welcome. And that's really weird because we understand as an audience that he's talking about a real person, but Gretel understands it as something different. So it's another example of dramatic irony, and we've mentioned this a few times before. Okay? As an audience, we're more informed about what's going on than the actual characters themselves. And that works really well. For, um, for this text. We've seen lots of good examples of it. So if you were to write on this text, that might be one of the things that you'll notice about how the story unfolds and develops and is told to us. All right. And this quote sort of captures that notion quite well. Bruno thought about it. He realised that he actually wanted to talk about Schmuel a little bit and this might be a way to do it without having to tell the truth about his existence. So it's kind of a lie by omission. He's not telling the truth, but he's telling some of the truth, telling some of the details. Okay? And we continue through the chapter. Um, and sh as Bruno goes through, he does reveal a lot of the history, a lot of the past of Schmuel about the watches and his grandfather and that sort of stuff. Um, and he talks about him as being his friend, okay? which he is. He's the only friend that he really has. Okay? Um, and it's as he's revealing this stuff, as he's sort of reminding himself of all these things, that he starts to understand Shmuel's story a little bit more. Okay? And of course, Gretel sort of pipes in, you know, I think you should stop. This is going on a little bit too far. It's getting a little bit silly. And Bruno's happy with that. He doesn't mind the taunting. And we finish the, the chapter because the the chapter conclusions are always significant here. Um, Bruno tried to return to his book, but he'd lost interest in it for now and stared out at the rain instead and wondered whether Schmuel, wherever he was, was thinking about him too and missing their conversations as much as he was. So it's a really good demonstration of a nice, close friendship that's being developed there.